Game Builder's Garage is finally out. And with it, people are trying to make all sorts of different creations. I've noticed that many creations have very static worlds where nothing in them move. In this guide, I'll show off the basic tools in the game to put things into very simple types of movement, like going back and forth or movement moving in lines or in circular orbits, etc. In order, I'm going to cover moving in straight lines out to infinity, moving in straight lines back and forth, moving in circular orbits, moving in complex 3D shapes, and then lastly, random motion. Let's say I want to put this apple in motion. My two main options are to connect it to a moving object or to connect it to an anchor point with a connection. And I'll describe each of those. Keep in mind that you probably want to set many of these materials properties to zero gravity so that they don't just fall down. One main way to put this apple in motion is to connect it with this connector to a moving object, in this case, a sphere. This moving object doesn't necessarily need to be visible or solid, etc. Here, it's just to be an object that will move. When working with moving objects, it's important to understand that X, Y, and Z are speeds. So if I feed in a constant node on with 0.5 into the X, that means have an X velocity of 0.5, constantly moving in X. For moving objects, you can change this mode between either taking in acceleration or taking in speed. So if I connect the apple to the moving box to the constant node on, this will create an apple that moves constantly in the X direction out into infinity. Of course, I can instead choose to give it a Y velocity, which will then cause the apple to move in the Y direction. Let's say I want the apple to move not just around X and Y, but I want it to move along some other line. For this, it's easy to use different values to feed into both the X and the Y, potentially with different values. So now this apple will move in both the X direction and the Y direction, but more in the X. So this setup will have the apple moving in a line going to the top right at an angle. Keep in mind that moving objects are influenced by items in their path. Since we're specifying the speed of that object, it's very easy for it to get off of that track. So here, if that apple bounces into a wall that deflects it, that apple will still keep trying to move in the direction that you're trying to tell it. However, it will get off of this line because it's hit that wall. The next major type of movement I wanna cover is going back and forth in a straight line. And this is very useful when you want lifts or just enemies that patrol an area. For movement along a straight line, slide connectors are very powerful. To use them, you should connect the object that you actually want to move to the slide connector and then to some anchor point. And here, this is a sphere, which is an immovable object. This sphere can be completely invisible, but it acts as like the origin or like a, a reference point for the coordinate system. While moving boxes take in speeds or acceleration into their inputs, connectors, slide connectors of all sorts, they take in a coordinate position. So if you feed a one into a slide connector, you're telling it to go to the coordinate X equals one. But if you feed an, a one into a moving box, then you're telling it to move with a speed of one. When you have a slide connector, whatever axis you specify will be the axis of the movement. So if we want the apple to go back and forth, left and right indefinitely, then we need to feed in a number that goes up and down in a loop. To do this, all we need is a counter node on. This counter node on can be set to bounce, which means that when you keep adding a number to it, when it reaches this maximum value, then adding to it will actually send it down in the opposite direction until it reaches the other limit and goes back and forth. So this naturally programs the back and forth movement. Then we can use a constant node on that feeds the counter that specifies the speed. So a 0.1 would go slower than a 1.0. When putting all these pieces together, that makes the apple go back and forth. When you use a slide connector, that object will make sure that it stays along that path. If its path gets blocked, then its path will be interrupted. But unlike a moving box, it won't start bouncing in some opposite direction. So here with this apple, if we put a box in its way, it'll just keep banging against the wall for all eternity. Again, we can completely control this apple by what is going on with the counter. So if we put no limit on the counter, so the counter just keeps counting up indefinitely, then the apple will just try to keep going in the positive x direction for all eternity. And it will not take any sort of detours. It will only move in the x axis. This is a pattern that you want to memorize because it's going to be useful for all sorts of different types of movement. Generally, the object that you actually care about will connect to some connector to your anchor point and then we'll be using some mathematical manipulation to figure out exactly what coordinate we want to send it to. Where slide connectors let you move along an axis, 
a hinge connector allows you to rotate along an axis. Here we have an X, Y, and Z axis. Whichever axis is specified by the hinge connector is the one for rotation. So you understand how axes of rotation work. The direction of the axis is perpendicular to the plane. So if you are rotating along the Z axis, then you are rotating along the X, Y plane, which is the plane of the screen. Just as before, we feed an increasing counter into the hinge port so that the hinge has its angle constantly changing with time. And like this, this rocket will constantly rotate indefinitely. Next, we have the most important connector of them all, the free slide connector. A slide connector only allows movement along a single axis, only along one line. A free slide connector allows you to have complete control over X, Y, and Z. Don't worry if you don't understand 3D coordinates very well, because for a free slide connector, you can just turn off the directions that don't matter for you. This apple is once again connected to this anchor point with a counter that goes back and forth between negative two and positive two. So the result is exactly the same as what we had with a regular sliding connector. So why would I use this? Let's say I want to control the movement on a different line, that it's not just X and not just Y. Now I can take this counter that goes back and forth and feed that output also into a map. This map just scales the number by some different amount. In this example, this map just takes your output and doubles it. With this setup, we are feeding in one number into the X value and double that number into the Y value. The result of this is an apple that moves at an angle. It's moving along a line, but it's moving along Y equals 2X. This is the same as using a calculator to multiply the result. But the point is that you can use whatever mathematical manipulation to specify the coordinates of the apple whenever you want it. Remember, you can change whatever the coordinates are going into the free slide to manipulate whatever object you actually care about relative to the anchor. Let's say that we instead tie the control stick to this. So let's say we have a control stick that feeds a counter node on that keeps track of the total amount the stick has been pressed in a certain direction, and then we use a map to divide that value by 10 so it's a reasonable number. We can feed each stick into the X and Y coordinates of a free slider. The result is an apple that moves very, very smoothly along the XY plane without ever being allowed to move into the Z direction. Let's say instead of keeping track of the coordinate, we can have an extra step in between. Now, remember that the free slider takes in coordinates, but we can use a moving object, like a moving sphere, to take in inputs of speed or acceleration. So here I have two sticks that move the X and Y of the moving object, just like in one of the tutorials. This moving object is the anchor point for my apple. This moving object connects to this free slider, which is only allowed to move in the X and Y directions, and then is connected to this anchor point. As a result, I can now move my apple very smoothly with acceleration, or speed if I choose instead, around the map. So you might ask, Loop, I could already do that without the free slider. Why would I want this? Now this object cannot move off the Z axis. So even if it gets pushed, if I use some other object to move it around, it doesn't matter. Because one thing that very frequently happens in games is that you're controlling an object that is allowed to move in Z, and as a result, even though you want a 2D game, it kind of like falls out of the plane, which is not really what you want in a 2D game. This free slider helps lock in that Z position so you don't move out of the plane. Now that you know how the different sliders and connectors work, I'm gonna focus on many different ways to get different shapes that you might want for your levels into the sliders. This mostly involves feeding in different mathematical functions. Let's say I have an apple that I want it to not just turn around sharply when it reaches the patrolling range, but I want it to kind of slow down more gradually when it turns around, which is more normal. The important note on here is angle to position. This nodon takes in a number as an angle and then outputs what the position would be horizontally or vertically. That means that this nodon is actually all of the trigonometric functions because horizontal position is actually a cosine function and the vertical position is actually a sine function. This nodon allows you to make all sorts of different sinusoidal waves. In this case, here I have a counter that increases without bound. That feeds this angle node on, and then I take the output that is a cosine, and I feed that cosine of that angle into the X position. That makes it so that when this apple moves around, it slowly decelerates as it reaches the edges of its range. But that's a pretty small range, right? 
So let's scale that by a map node on that multiplies that value by two or whatever other number you'd want. Now this apple patrols a much wider region, going back and forth and decelerating at the edges. Let's say we want a circle. Well, the formula for a circle is to put a cosine into the x and the sine into the y. So we have the same constantly increasing angle that then gets turned into a cosine and sine. And this gives us a circular orbit. Let's say I want a bigger circle. Then all I need to do is take the cosine and the sine and multiply it by my radius. In this case, I'm choosing a radius of two. Then I feed double that into the free slider to specify the coordinates. And this gives me an apple that rotates in a larger circle. Now is a good time to mention that we can stack different types of motion to get something more fancy. Here I have a, a green ball with a slide connector to my anchor point. And this slide connector moves back and forth with a counter that just goes back and forth with the bounce. This makes the green ball just go left and right in a very simple way. Now I can connect an apple to that green ball with a free slider and use the same increasing cosine block that we used before to feed that free slider. That way the apple bobs up and down into the Y axis around whatever the center point of that green ball is, which moves left and right. And here is an apple orbiting around a turnip. This turnip is connected with a free slider to my anchor point. And this is the code that specifies a circular orbit that spins at a rate of three with a radius of two. And so this is, this is a turnip that orbits around the anchor. Then I have the exact same code with an apple connected to a turnip by a free slider. And this is the code for a circular orbit. This orbit has a different speed and a smaller radius. This way, we are actually just layering one circular orbit on a different circular orbit. Going back to the circle, let's say we only scale the Y coordinate by some value. And so the X coordinate is times one and the Y coordinate is times two. This gives us an elliptical orbit instead of a circular orbit. Remember that we can use all sorts of different mathematical functions. Some of them can be more complicated and some of them can be easier. This, for example, is a spherical orbit with a radius of two and two different speeds along different axes of the sphere. So this apple will orbit this sphere with a radius of two in this more interesting or more erratic way. Lastly, we can mix and match different aspects of movement to the different coordinates. Again, this is the basic code for a circle, and this is going to the X and Z axes. This will cause the apple to move in a circle in the X, Z plane. We can again add a counter that constantly goes back and forth to the Y axis. This gives us a helix as the apple moves constantly back and forth in the Y axis, but still goes in a circle in the X, Z plane. The last important type of movement that I really want to talk about is random motion. This RNG nodon is stimulated by constant nodon. Then I use a map to scale that RNG output, which is always a positive integer, into this range, which can be both negative and positive. That output is fed into a counter, which has a maximum and minimum range. That way, we don't let the apple wander too far away. This whole block makes a number that will constantly fluctuate up and down, but will never exceed a certain range. When we feed that into the X value of a free slider, now we have an apple that seemingly jitters back and forth along this X axis. That was just the X, but what if we feed the exact same block of code into the Y axis, which feeds from a completely different random number? This makes an apple that seemingly jitters randomly in both X and Y. Adding multiple apples to the same scene shows that we indeed do have random motion, and this is called a random walk. That motion was very jittery, so let's smooth it up a little bit. Here, I still have a constantly sim simulated RNG output that gets mapped and feeds a counter that has a maximum and minimum range. The difference is that now I have a calculator that counts kind of like an if statement. This calculator is connected to a timer that only activates that calculator every 0.1 second. Since the timer outputs zero or one, this means that the random number generator is only allowed to update the value of the counter every 0.1 second. Applying this to both X and Y makes the apple dart around randomly, kind of like a hummingbird. For the last setup, let's say I want to smooth out the random movement of the apple even more. Here I can use a moving object, which is locked in the Z plane with this free slide connector on an anchor point. The X and Y acceleration for this moving object is each one separately incrementing RNG value 
However, the RNG is only stimulated every 0.1 second. This means that the speed or acceleration of the moving object is only updated every 0.1 second instead of every single frame. This gives a movement for the apple that is still random, but is much more smooth. That's all I have for you today. As GBG only came out two days ago, the community is still learning a whole lot about how to work this game engine and make it work as best as possible. While new techniques will be discovered in the future, I hope this guide helped you learn how to better put objects into motion and hopefully it was more helpful than what Bob and Alice have to share. If you like more content like this, feel free to like and subscribe and I'll see you around. Later!